Sure. Can I get started? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me here at uh, JM Beyond 2011. Uh, my name is Jack Bremer. I've come over from London where I run a full service digital marketing agency, web design, development, SEO, social media, a whole lot. Um, we've been going since 1998, and in those 13 years, um, we've worked with a variety of different content management systems, and over the last four or so years, really settled on Joomla being the tool that we want to use. It allows us to build extremely scalable websites, and pretty much any request that a client may have, Joomla's been able to satisfy it, no problems at all, um, or we've been able to customize it, build our own components, and this kind of thing. I'm just going to get the microphone and see. Hello? It doesn't work. It's not working? It, it's, it's never worked. <laughs> so I project it a little louder? Did that help? Alright. Um, so, what we've found over the last 13 years is that having best practice in place can really, really help at, point at every stage through the process of developing the site and then when you go on to launch it. Um, one of the things we now do is we include this in our pitch process. So, we actually describe the best practice process that we have. Uh, in the pitch, and what you'll often find is any companies that's trying to undercut you on price aren't offering this kind of polished service. So when we launch a site, the client knows that they're going to have absolutely every everything ticked, all their T's crossed, I's dotted, etc. So they're going to work well in the search engines. It's going to be fast. It's going to be secure, and it's going to be up to date. Um, so with us, we tell them you get like a 30-step best point, uh, best practice point list. Everything's ticked off. Um, now, one of the important things is, as you all know, when you launch a site, you've only got one chance. So you've got to launch it right. If you don't launch it right, you're going to run into all kinds of problems. Now, what do I mean by prepare for a fight? Well, if you've got the groundwork done, it's going to make future work and future development much, much easier. If you get things like the SEO correct on site, when six months or 12 months down the line, the client says to you, do you know what, we need to improve our search ranking then you're going to be able to go in and do the off-site work much quicker, much easier, because the on-site work has already been done. Um, now, with regards to SEO, we talk about a 25-75% uh, split. We'd say that 25% of the work that you need to do with regards to getting your site to climb the, the search rankings needs to be done on-site. And if you don't do that, then the rest of the time you spend is either going to be much more difficult or it may just be wasted completely. So this best practice I'll talk about today, one of the things will be with regards to SEO aspects. And then that 75% comes later on, um, which is a topic for another day. Um, if you don't get your best practice stuff right before the launch, then you can destroy all of your hard work that you may have spent in years preceding the Joomla website. All of your hard work climbing up the search rankings may be for nothing. Now, um, if you launch it correctly, your clients can remember how smooth it went rather than remembering how terrible this all was because you, you had a couple of broken links or missed out some bits and pieces. So launch it right and you're going to make a great impression. Now, one of the important aspects is the project management. And the tool that we like to use for that is called Pivotal Tracker. You can see it here. Um, this is an Agile Methodologies project management tool and we use certain aspects of that. Now, most of the projects that we handle um, are typically a project over a matter of days or weeks in length. Um, agile methodologies can really help you when you're building some bigger projects that are lasting months or years in development, and then you can have all kinds of different meetings and use a lot more of the, the agile methodologies. And we use Pivotal Tracker uh, in really quite a simplified way. Um, in reality, we throw into this a CSV file of all of our best practice items. So we know that we cannot launch the site, we cannot get to a point where we're ready to press go on the site unless they're all ticked off. And then we add into this all of the product features that we need for any components that we're building, for anything the site needs to do or have on it. So absolutely every element is in there. Um, any item that you add in can be a chore, a bug, or a feature. You can assign points to it, and you can have it track how many staff you've got working on a project so you know how long the project's going to take and how much you're likely to get done in this iteration, which is usually for us a week period. Now, there is an alternative. Um, if you're not looking for something as fully featured as that, there's an alternative called launchlist.net. And it's a paid service. It's purely for doing this kind of best practice launch stuff. 
We've had a look at it, it looks absolutely beautiful. Um, and we like Google Traffic because it brings the whole project management side of it for our internal team into one place. Now, because we use Pivotal Tracker, we can have many tasks going on at one time. Because we throw all of the things that we need to get done for the site in there, all the best practice items, all the features of the site and everything else, I can have working at once designers, search guys, and my developers all in there, and that means that a site can be built much, much quicker. Because you can assign tasks to people, they can come into what's for me, bam, and they just go in and do the tasks. It doesn't matter so much the order you get things done, as long as it's all getting done. Um, if you're developing things on your own, then of course you can refine the actual flow and the order of things so that you can decide today I'm going to work on the SEO aspects, tomorrow I'm going to work on security aspects, and because you can group things together, you can go and do one set of tasks at a time. I'll come back on to uh, Pivotal Tracker later on, but that's a view of one of the columns um, in Pivotal Tracker there. Now, proper planning is important. As you are probably all aware, if you don't get the planning in place, the project can last a hell of a lot longer, and this can be an absolute nightmare. Now, um, with regards to the information architecture, what we tend to do is we, we provide a spreadsheet online using Google Spreadsheets with all of the different menu items that are required. We then have another column with regards to what kind of content it's going to be. It's either a category, or it's an item, or it's a particular component, or whatever. And then we have a, a, another column showing the stage that we're at with that particular item. And we color code everything and allow the client to log in via Google Spreadsheet <coughs> so that they can see what content they need to still need to write for the site. That means, of course, our developers can go in, prepare all the content, we can migrate whatever we need from the old site, tick it off when it's done, and the client knows where they're at with content. So you don't get to a point where you're ready to launch, but there's missing content. That's always such a pain because then the client says, I'm not ready to go yet, I haven't got the content ready, I can't launch without a finished website, and the website drags on and on and on. And as you're probably aware, until the client has paid that final invoice, <coughs> they tend to assume that all the work you do is including that initial bill cost. So maintaining good communication, making sure you know exactly where you're at with the project and the content that's going in is important. So once we've got the menu items, the structure of our content and everything ready, we'll either be throwing that content into a site or migrating it as necessary. Now, once you have installed your Jimmy install, you're going to start putting that content in. And it's really important that you do things like the meta descriptions and these kind of things as you go. Any content that you're putting in, make sure that you've got all of the old tags, title tags, everything correct so that when you launch the site, you, you ticked off these SEO boxes. If you are importing into the database, then you can actually do a lot of work in PHP My Admin to clean out bad code from old sites, old CSS styles, these kind of things that are just not needed. <coughs> and there's a certain amount of that you can automate um, and a certain amount that you're going to have to do by hand. But the cleaner you get the code in the actual content, the better. Now, um, I'll jump through this part quite quickly. I hope Juno itself, um, as you're probably aware, you've read the guides, or you're doing it yourself already, when you install it, we want to um, remove the admin, which is number 62. We want to change the database prefix, and we tend to remove the generator of the site from the template. Um, there's no point bringing attention to the fact it's a Joomla site because people are searching all over for vulnerabilities that they hear of, and you don't want them finding your site and searching for what vulnerabilities you have. So we remove the generator equals Joomla, and we tend to put in there our company name. If you're running a development site in parallel with the current site that's live, then we tend to switch it offline, which provides a simple login at the front end when the person comes to the site. Uh, we might build in a folder like forward slash new or something like this, um, and that means that your client can log in and see the site as they go along. You could also use HD access authentication at this point on the folder, or you can use a secret URL. So if you're developing perhaps on your own server with an IP address, it's usually much nicer to have an attractive URL, so you might leave a redirect on the old site, or you might use a, a URL shortener. If you're using a URL shortener, such as Bitly, make sure you don't shorten the link while you're logged in, because otherwise it will be added to your publicly viewable list of URLs that you've shortened, and it may, you may find there are some people coming onto your site while you're developing it before you're ready. Um, what we tend to do when we're developing the site is that we build on our local development server in our office <coughs> the basics of the template and any custom components that we need to build. We then, as soon as we can, get that live onto a real web server out there in the wild 
but protect it as much as is necessary depending on the sensitivity of the project. That means that the client can see it as soon as you're ready to give them that link and we can drop things in and test in the real environment, um, not relying on any kind of local issues that may be different from out there in the wild. Set things up as you install them. So we tend to have a, a set of, of components and plugins that we put on every single site that we install. And when you're putting them in, make sure you get your settings right from the start. So JCE, for example, is our WYSIWYG editor of choice. And we'll go in there and immediately remove all of the admin buttons, uh, all the, the, the toolbar buttons that are not necessary for admins right off the bat. Get it right and you can tick it off your list as soon as possible. So do things as you go along. And then get rid of any unneeded components. I don't think we've ever used Joomla polls. I don't think we've used web links since 2006 or so when I built the first Joomla version 1 site and we thought, well, this is great, we can do it all directly with WebLinks. Turn off, uninstall, um, unpublish the components, plugins that you don't need. Strip everything out that you know you're not going to need. And then redo that process again. Have the second item in your to-do list so that you do it before launch. Because there may be some things that you're testing while you're building the site that you end up not using on the live site. So just go through that as a, as a final item as well. So we're removing things at the start and then double checking that we really want everything in at the end. Now, we tend to start our site development with a structure, a sort of bare bones template if you like. This is one that we've built from scratch. Uh, we've dabbled with playing things from the template clubs and if that's working for you then great. But we tend to do everything from scratch, completely bespoke template building. And you want to find your own preferred structure from which to do that. And this is always evolving for us. And in the last few months, we found something called HTML5Boilerplate.com. Um, it's a whole set of, um, of tools and things that you could scripts that you can use in your site to make sure this can be maximum compliant with browsers, speed things up, and, and really help you out in a lot of ways. Now, we don't use all of the aspects of it, we take from it what we need. We tend to use the modernizer script, um, which checks for browser features that are present on a site visitor's browser. Um, and if they're using old browsers, it will adapt things as is necessary. Um, it'll add in classes automatically at the top for the different browsers. And it'll load in jQuery, etc., where appropriate. We also use the CSS reset template from HTML5 boilerplate to, uh, to boost the cross-browser compatibility. Now they have a revised HT Access template that we're also quite fond of, and we tend to take some elements of that and combine it into the Joomla standard HT Access file uh, for maximum security um, and to do things like set caching limits of files correctly and this kind of thing. It also can set IE6 visitors who are using Chrome Frame to use that automatically, which is a plugin for IE6, which means it renders essentially Chrome code within the IE6. Uh, window and it can actually even prompt them to install that as well. Often you'll find people in corporate environments aren't able to install anything more modern than 96, so that can be a great way to get around that. Um, one thing that uh, Phil Locke uh, really subscribes to is source ordering. So when you're building your template, make sure that things that are not particularly necessary for things for, for Google and the search spiders, put those at the bottom of the code. Make things as easy as possible for Google by sticking the important stuff, the content, right at the top as much as possible. <coughs> I've also got up here Google Code and jQuery and Moodles. Now, you can refer to the Google Ajax libraries direct from Google. That's going to help you in a couple of ways. It's going to make things faster because the Google CDN is extremely fast at delivering those, those, those scripts. And also, most visitors these days to websites have been to a site sometime in their recent past that used the Google Ajax libraries. So the chances are it's already cached in their browser, in their computer. So that's going to speed things up for you. You don't have to load it all locally. Remove things if they're not needed. If you don't need root tools, you don't need jQuery. Remove things out as much as you possibly can. Over on, uh, on Google Code, there's a minifying script that can really help you with regards to minifying the JavaScript and the CSS that's used on your site. So we tend to do this towards the end of the build process, and it'll take a, a long, large CSS file, and it will combine it into one single line without any white space, really reducing the file size. Make sure you keep backups and more backups of your original files, because if you have to go through, break that up, and see where you want to make changes, you're going to have a nightmare. 
So keep the backups to that, but minify your code where you can. Remove all the unnecessary rules from your CSS, merge them, and this kind of thing. There are some aspects of the HTML5 boilerplate that can help you with that. Do you have an unminified tool? Uh, there is one for JavaScript that I know of that we use a lot. Uh, um, yes. And my colleague Jordan will remind me. HTML Beautify. HTML Beautify. Yeah. You just paste it in and do it there. So that can definitely help. Sometimes you're looking at a site thinking, how on earth did they do that? And you can get to the file, but it's already been minified, and so that can help you get it back to a structure that you can use. Phil? Uh, can I just say that there's a new extension that we've been plugging in, but I think you can take away the voice for exporting. Okay. So you actually don't have to use that extension right now. Okay, great. Uh, which you know, I can pass around my but I literally found it days ago. Uh, it works super well. Okay, perfect. Um, in case that wasn't heard on, on the camera, Phil Lott was just saying this is now a plugin that will strip out the white space from the files as you go. So um, if, if Phil will supply me with the link for that, then I can add it to the, uh, to the presentation notes afterwards. Now, your images. It's important that you get your images as small as possible and yet look as good as possible. So load large images early. If you've got large background images, get them to the top of your CSS. Load them in as early as possible because then it will carry on downloading while you can request all of the tiny smaller files much, much quicker from your browser while this one is downloaded. Um, as you're probably aware, there's only so many concurrent files that you can be getting down onto your machine at once. Chris Davenport wrote a great presentation last year at, at JMBR 2010 all about speeding up your template. So I'm going to get everything that he said because if that's all online, you can view that. One of the things that he suggests is serving images from a cookie-free domain. Um, when you serve a, an image from a domain that uses cookies, it'll usually carry something like a one kilobyte amount of overhead with regards to that cookie for each and every image. If you've got lots of images on your site, that can really add up. So you can do that from a subdomain if you can figure that carefully, or a CDN. Using CSS sprites, you can see up here, um, if you're not using that already, it can, be, it can seem quite daunting with regards to the code that you need to use, but there are lots of tools online to help you with that. And CSS Sprite helps because you're downloading, one load, you're downloading one file and then you're referencing the area of the file that you need to refer to. Um, one great idea that Chris gave me as well last year was if you've got a landing page that people are coming to on your site from Facebook ads, Google ads, these kind of things, Use the chance that you've got. They're reading the landing page for 10, 20, 30 seconds. Use that chance to load in the large sprites. So they're reading that. Then when they go to the next page of the site, they've already got that cache in their browser. So just think about where people are coming to your site and where you can optimize where you can get those images downloaded for them. Crushing images can be really helpful as well. Um, images that you're making in Photoshop, you can reduce those in size as much as possible. But using things like Smush It can remove all the exit data. There's lots of metadata in images and using Smush It can help you strip all that out and save sometimes anywhere between 2 and 40 percent they tend to get uh, a file saving using Smush It. Uh, we've actually built a Smush It plugin for K2, so if you're using K2 and you want to help us test that before we release it to the community, what that will do is when someone adds an image into a K2 item, they click save or apply at the top, the image gets uploaded to the server, K2 crunches it into five different file sizes and then our plugin sends it off to Smush It, hosted over at Yahoo, and that then delivers back all five sizes already compressed as much as possible. So that takes around 20 seconds at the moment. We're looking for ways that we might be able to speed that up, but I think it's really come down to the other servers, how fast that can be. So you can add a little processing time to putting content in, but it can save time for your visitors. Save time for your visitors on the site, you're also going to help yourself with regards to Google, because Google is now using uh, speed as a language factor. Come on to that more later. CDN distribution, I mentioned already, the images. We're playing at the moment with a tool called cloudflare.com. Recommend going and having a look, having a play, maybe with not your most mission critical sites, but all you have to do with Cloudflare is change your name server to them, or name servers to theirs, and that's pretty much it. You can then go in and you can play with settings if you want to on theirs, uh, on cloudflare.com, but it's a pretty easy setup right, for, right from the outset. And they will give you reporting on the amount of bandwidth that's saved, and the amount of time that is actually saved for your visitors. So it's great to be able to show a client that this month we've saved 3.5 days of download time for our visitors to the site. It protects you with regards to security as well, so that's definitely worth checking out. It's a free CDN, so your site will be faster and more secure. 
Fab icons are another thing we have in our best practice list. So every site goes out there with a fabulous looking fab icon and also icons for iPhone and iPad. It doesn't happen very often, but people do like to save um, sites to their home screen on their iPhone or iPad. And the people that tend to do that are usually your client. So make sure that looks nice and put a nice icon in there for them. That's another one of our uh, tick boxes on the best practice guide. If you're doing fab icon, the, one we, the tool we tend to use is from tools.dynamicdrive.com slash favicon. We found it's the most compatible. Um, it tends to keep the transparency if you've got transparency around the edge of the fab icon. Moving on to security. Uh, this is an almost unlimited area of discussion within the human community. Um, and we're constantly evolving the items that we put into our best practice guide. Um, We've already mentioned some of the aspects of security, things like getting your HG access right, this kind of thing. One of the things you can do is you can block access to XML files within HG access. Um, bear in mind that this shouldn't be a, a, a one fix for all, you know, it's not a one size fits all fix with regards to all your sites. It depends what you need your site to do. We found some issues with if you're using PHP list as well as Joomla on a site. We've also found some fixes for that. Um, if you need people to be able to access XML files, don't put that into HD access. Um, but there are simply the five lines of standard uh, uh, lines of code in the Joomla HD access file that you can simply uncomment, and that's going to work for you to prevent XML access. Why would you want to do that? Well, the tools that you have installed in your Joomla site, the components, the plugins, the modules, they have an XML file which releases information such as the version that you're on. And as we know, vulnerabilities are found all the time in, in the different add-ons for our sites. Hackers are tracking for these vulnerabilities. They can easily scan and find out which version you've got in your site, and you're hacked just like that. Now, what I tend to do is, and we try and do this more and more, and it, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to do because you, you're throwing all these different components and modules and plugins onto your site, um, but you really want to track what you're putting on and what version. So this here is a screen grab of the Excel sheet that I've built. Haven't found a way to do it nicely within Google Spreadsheets because it's difficult to compare columns. But essentially what I've got here is the name here of a particular Joomla component, plugin and module, the developers, just in case we need to track them down, the URL for any updates, and then this column here shows the latest version of the plugin. I know it's not up to date right now, it's just example information. The next two columns, and however many other columns, are all of the websites that you're managing for your clients. And so this column shows the version of any particular tool you have on the Joomla site. By comparing this one using conditional formatting to this one, and then spreading the formatting down, you can have it highlight red whenever the two don't match. So when there's a new update for uh, Joomla, for example, you can go and just update this to 1.5.24, for example, and any of your sites that aren't as up-to-date as the latest version are going to highlight red. You then know which ones you need to go through an update. By doing that as you go along, whenever you install something on your sites, you can keep track of exactly where you're at. So this is a best practice idea um, on a larger scale with regards to all your sites ongoing and during build. Um, it's the most helpful way that I found to do it. Yesterday there was a talk, I think it was yesterday or maybe the day before, on a tool called J Monitoring. Um, I wasn't actually able to get in that talk, but the people when they saw it said that it was fantastic. Um, and I know that Phil Taylor over at Blue Flame IT is also working on a tool that is going to get all of your sites talking to each other so that you from one central place can see exactly what needs to be updated um, and all this kind of thing. So monitoring your actual plugins, components and things. I've got questions for you. Go ahead. Is this the sort of thing that we addressed with the app, uh, the app store idea that was mooted the other day? Well, it quite possibly could be. Um, a, a, a chap put up the other day at the Lightning Talks and suggested a Joomla app store whereby within the back end of Joomla, you could actually browse all of the different extensions, install them from there, and see what needs to be updated. Uh, it's an interesting idea. It would take, obviously, a lot of, of, of help and collaboration and communication within the community. But we are all at one particular level here. Um, yeah, give or take, we're at different levels of, of coding ability, but we have all typically got a lot of experience at Joomla. But we need to be aware that in the community, there are always people arriving new to Joomla who have very varying levels of, of coding experience and ability, and I think making things as easy as possible for them to get involved is really going to help. We mustn't forget those people are leaving behind 
um, because that's the new blood that's coming in that's going to really help the community. Um, so yeah, I think if, if that comes to fruition, that, that could be fantastic. Um, and, and, and it would be great to see all those things talking together so we can see what needs updated. So next, Google Analytics. Um, best practice, we make sure every site we launch has Google Analytics. Even if they want to use other tracking as well, we put Google Analytics on the site. It means that there's a, a, a standardized way for them to see exactly what's going on on the site. Um, there are so many guides to Google Analytics, it works so well with so many other third party systems that you might use. The plugin we tend to put on one of our sites is called Joomlagator. It's been around for a long time and it does some extra things other than just tracking standard analytics of which page and where they come from and things. It also adds in there user tracking, it adds in there download tracking and external links, and that can all be very relevant. Um, if anyone's got any plugins for Joomla, uh, sorry, for Google Analytics that they prefer, then, uh, then do please uh, chime in because if Joomla again is one that's been around for a little while, then maybe something that's faster, better, more functions or whatever, do recommend. If you have a static IP within your office, or you know your client does, then we would go into the Google Analytics filters and we would filter out that traffic. Because ultimately, um, there are two, te two things I tend not to want um, swaying might be the, the stats that we're collecting on the site. One is our own development traffic while we're testing something. We might refresh a page a hundred times while we're developing a site. That's not relevant from the marketing standpoint. Um, and also people within the actual organization you're building the site for, typically we're not interested in their traffic either. And this is an internet, this kind of thing. So where you can, filter that out. There are various ways to do it with cookies as well. They're a little more complicated and require no one ever cleans their cookies out on a per computer basis. Um, but strip out that if you possibly can. At this point, you install Google Analytics. Within Analytics itself, I tend to create custom segments as well for the tracking, so that I can see all of the traffic that's come from social media, for example. Google Analytics, as you're probably aware, you can see all of the, the traffic that's coming in from paid ads, and referrer sites, and search engines. By creating a custom segment for social sites, uh, that can really help as well. Once you create a particular custom segment in analytics, you can then apply that to any of your other site profiles too. So that's time well spent. Now on speed, the speed of the site, as I mentioned earlier, Google is using site speed, speed of download, as a ranking factor now. Um, this means that choosing your hosting provider is more important than ever, and choosing how you set up your actual site is more important than ever. Um, we want to essentially squeeze out every ounce of speed that we can from the site. So we're, we're reducing file sizes where possible, we're reducing the number of files that need to be downloaded by the visitors. Turn on GZIP compression is another tick box on our best practice list. Two places that we tend to do that, one is in the global config of Joomla, and secondly is in the setup um, panel of JCE editor. We can switch that on as well. Decide on your caching approach. Uh, we tend to only use caching on some of the, our largest sites, um, but on those ones, caching is really important. And if you're not using caching yet, then I recommend you go and read some guides on it, uh, because there are a variety of different um, caching techniques in the standard journal, plus a bunch of different plugins. You want to decide how you're doing the caching, and you want to test it a lot. You then want to explain to your client, if you're using caching, exactly what happens when they save an item, so you don't get agile phone calls in the middle of the night saying, I'm press save, but the site hasn't updated else going on. Um, a great little tool from No Number called Clean Cache, which just sits at the top of the site and you can clean the cache with one click of a button. Um, so that's definitely worth figuring out. So caching is something we would import on our CSV and then we take it out if it's not necessary for a smaller site. On to cross-browser testing. This is something that we tend to do um, a little bit while we're, while we're building, while we're developing, um, especially if we're, if we're building custom components. Um, but it tends to be something that we do towards the end of the build. So before you launch, that's the point when we tend to go and do all of our cross-browser testing. And it's a real pain. There are a bunch of different um, tools out there to help you do it. We're running virtual machines out there in the cloud and we'll view the site for you. We tend to really like to get stuck into the site and test lots of different aspects. So we tend to run virtual machines in our own office. So we're testing across Linux, Mac, PC, iPhone, and iPad. And we're testing where we can on those platforms with IE6, 7, 8, and 9, 
Firefox versions 2, 3, and 4, Chrome, Safari, and sometimes if we're feeling uh, really good about the client, we might test on Opera as well. So it's, it's, it's a couple of hours at the end of a, of a cycle process, but it's important because often you don't know what the client is using on their machine. So make sure, uh, if I said it already, launch it right. You've only got one chance, so make sure when the client sees it, it's working nicely in the browser. On to backups. Your backup strategy is important. Um, you'll be running your own backups within your office, on your own local server. This kind of thing, uh, a lot of people are doing backups these days to the cloud as well for their local information. Back up the site as you go if you can, if you're being really diligent. Make sure before you launch you do a final backup of everything so you know exactly where you're at. Two backup tools that we like using, the Kiba Backup. Um, won a, a Josca last night, so congratulations to Nick. Um, I think he's giving a talk in another room at the moment, so he can be here. Um, now, Phil Locke suggests that when you're using a Kiba Backup, Send it to a backup every single night and send that backup over to Amazon S3. Run another script to delete that backup after 30 days. So you've got a month's worth of backup sitting on Amazon S3. Now that you're thinking, wait a minute, my site's enormous, that's going to use a lot of bandwidth, it's going to cost a lot of money. Well, there's ways within the Kiwi you can tell it not to back up the images, stories, folder, and certain folders that are less important for you. Um, we tend to use Dropbox if the client wants a local backup as well. They often feel really safe and secure if they know that there's a backup of their site sitting on their local machine. So Dropbox can, can be great for that. Um, free accounts, uh, I think it's up to two gig, I think, for a free account, um, or you can pay for larger ones. Uh, so you just go keep an eye and make sure it doesn't get too full. Um, but you can do a backup through Dropbox as well. <coughs> Bear in mind if you're using a keyboard backup, that it will typically take up the size of your site, it will take up again when it saves that compressed file of your site onto the server. So make sure you've got enough hosting space that to happen. Another one that we, uh, we've enjoyed having with is called Lazy Backup. And what that will do is it will take your entire database, it will compress it, and it will email it to you on whatever schedule you like, as many times a day as you want. Um, and so once you schedule that, it'll literally just come through as an email with the attached database all uh, compressed nicely for you. Um, you can go and set up a separate email account for each client or just your backups or whatever. You're going to get 7.5 gig of uh, storage space in a Gmail account or Google Apps um, ID, so that's definitely a good way to go as well. So once you've got your backup set up, um, another thing that I like to do is set my robots.txt file correctly. Um, the robots.txt file is what tells the search engine spiders where they're allowed and where they're not allowed. Um, the bottom part here, this is the standard stuff that you get within the Joomla robots file. And then we tend to add a couple of things to that. If we're using K2, then I like to allow the Google image spider to find all of the images that we use in our K2 items. If we're not, we're using standard Joomla. I want to tell it to go into the images stories folder and have access to those. So the way we do that, and this will be in the show notes afterwards, is that we allow Google images at the top, the, the Google bot images, access into those particular folders. The second one that I've got there is with regards to AdSense. And the at Google AdSense crawler, um, you want, I tend to just give that access to the entire website. It's not spider <coughs> to show the results in the search engine, it's actually spider <coughs> so that it knows what ads to show on your site. So if the site is using Google, Google AdSense, then I'll put that in. If it's not, strip it out, because of course you want to keep everything as lean as possible, so you've got as little code to, to debug later on if necessary. Um, now, but at this point as well, I tend to test all of the forms. So you'll have your own favorite form components. Um, we typically tend to use chronoforms. <coughs> it's a very simple site, we might just use the standard contacts feature of Joomla. You want to test all those forms, test the emails are coming through to the correct places. <coughs> you're, you're getting a copy if you need that as admin of the site. Check that your client is getting a copy. Check that the person submitting the actual form is getting a copy. And at this point, you're probably going to want to turn on database collection as well because email is only so reliable. Um, the last <coughs> thing is to find out the client tells you after two weeks they've had no inquiries, or they've had no entries to the competition, or whatever it is. And if the emails haven't been getting through, you're stuck. If you've got it saved into a database, then you're sorted, you can download that to CSV and say, well, look, here's what you've been missing, and from now on, I've tested it, and it's working. So get the forms tested at this point as well. Build your 404 page. We like to use SH404SEF 
for all of our URL management on the site. And from what I've been hearing around here, everyone either loves it or hates it. We love it, I uh, think it's fantastic. Adds a little admin overhead. Um, if your clients aren't quite used to what the difference is between an ID and an item ID and this kind of thing, but it could be fantastic and it reduces the duplicate URLs on your site. Now, SH404 SEF also does the 404 page handling. Um, so that creates a pretty nice 404 page, and as Hugh was mentioning in his talk on SEO yesterday, we tend to then use load position to pull in the search module as well into that page so that people can actually, they can see they're on the one page, they, they put a search feature right there. Um, there's a plugin we were hearing about yesterday, I forget the name of it, and that can actually auto-suggest based on the URL, <coughs> and misspellings and this kind of thing. So that's something that we can look into and in the show notes afterwards. Check your error log at this point as well, um, because there will be a lot of things while you've been developing that haven't worked quite right. It's a great idea to check the error log, see if there's anything that needs final tweaking and fixing, and then clean that error log out so you know when you press go and it launches live, that anything collected from that point is genuine in the wild errors. And a final few notes on <coughs> SEO and search. We use the website name generator plugin, which will take the name of the site on a Gmail 1.5 site and it'll put it either before or after. We tend to go after the page name of the actual page that you're on. And then you can either put a hyphen or a pipe or whatever you like in between the two. Because uh, Gmail 1.5, as you probably know, out of the box doesn't tend to put the site name into the title of the page. Um, we use the SEO canonicalization plugin or HG Access to redirect either non www dot traffic to the www dot or vice versa. Uh, it's a discussion for you to have with your client, but that needs to go on your best practice list as well. You can make sure that's done. If you don't, Google will have duplicate listings of your site with and without the www dot. At this point, we'll jump into Google Webmaster Tools. And in Google Webmaster Tools, we'll confirm in there that whatever our strategy is, the www dot prefix or not, matches what we've set in Google Webmaster Tools. If you're not using Webmaster Tools already, just so you know, it will also let you do things like strip out parameters from URLs, from the Google results. Um, if the site already exists and existed within there, then you can see how um, traffic is coming to your site which are the referring sites, which keywords are being used, these kind of things. So it can give you a little uh, extra information on top of Google Analytics. And you can set the geographic tar target as well. So if, you, if you're building on a .com, but it's mainly for a, a community in a certain area, you can set the geographic target there. Now I've mentioned SH404 SEF uh, with regards to the 404 pages. At this point, you also want to be thinking about your SEF URL strategy if you're going to be using it or if you're not. And if you are, what tools are you going to use and how you're going to set that up. And if you refer to Hugh's presentation from yesterday on SEO, he's got all of his best practice with regards to the actual settings that he uses in SH 404 SEF to get the most out of the, out of the tool and to get the settings just right for search engines. Prepare now for your sitemap submission. So the sitemap tool that we fall in love with is called XMAP. You're probably aware of it. Um, a couple of extra things for XMAP. If you're using K2, then there's an X, XMAP K2 plugin that will allow the sitemap to index your K2 content as well. <coughs> if you're using uh, K2, there's another one called uh, from DM Digital, which is a Google News sitemap tool. And that will actually create a Google News formatted sitemap from your K2 content. So you can specify the categories in the K2 that you want to pump out straight into Google News. Um, XMAP as it's just standalone, if you're not using K2, XMAP will also do news and image sitemaps as well now. So that will give you then a sitemap that you can be on your site for the clients and the, the visitors to the site so they can find a way around easily. But it will also give you a, an XML layout that you can pump into Google Webmaster Tools. And that's going to help them find, the site, uh, find their way through the site very quickly. If you don't do that, especially if you have a large site, Google can often give up or take forever to index all of the pages. So don't just assume that because it's somewhere in your site and a menu page links to something that links to something. Don't assume that Google's going to find it. Make it as easy as possible for them so they can index your content quickly. Redirecting old URLs is very important. If you are migrating, upgrading, changing an existing site that's already listed within Google, then you need to come up with a strategy for redirecting the URLs. Um, you can do that using various techniques, either an HD access or a 404 SEF. Various ways of doing it, and you'll have your own preferred way. 
what I tend to do is, if the site is enormous, lots and lots of URLs, we well, either need to get some help in to help you do it, um, or you need to make sure while you're putting the content in that you're creating appropriate aliases so that it creates the URLs as they always were. If you can't do these things, then you want to pick the most important pages of the site from a search engine point of view. And you want to take those and add to those the most important ones that they're listing, the most important landing pages that Google Analytics is informing you of, um, and also the main navigation uh, that there may be on the existing site. Take all of those URLs and redirect them as you need to. Now at this stage, we've, we've covered most of the, uh, of the tick boxes with regards to our SEO, uh, with regards to our best practice for launch. Um, and Pivotal Track is looking rather different now. We've got a couple of columns here, done and current, which is an example of items that, we, that we've had from a particular project. Everything that's green has been done and finished, and we can actually remove that column if we don't need to refer to it. It's all stuff that's been done. And over here what we have, things that are left to finish, or whatever else. So everything here has been started, a couple of them are ready to be finished. One at the top there is ready to be delivered. When we click on deliver, it will actually send an email to the owner of that task, and they'll be asked to come in and approve it. When they come in to approve it, they can simply click on accept. If they don't approve of what has been done on a particular feature of the site, they can click reject, put a message, and this email back to the person that's been working on it. So it's working really well um, in the cloud, allowing people to manage the project, but also keeping in touch with people via email and letting them know what's going on. You can give access to your client to this as well, so they, if you make them a user, they can actually approve or reject the items, the features of the site. They can see where you're at with the project as it's going along. Um, or you can just make them a viewer, which I think is at no charge. Um, so here we are. We, we know where we're at. We know we've got a few things left to finish, but we're pretty much we're getting ready now for launch. Um, at the point of launch, there are some more best practice things that we tend to do. So we want to press go on the site. We're then going to do things like we're going to use link tile up here um, to check through the site for any broken links. If you've migrated lots of content from an old site, it may be that there are links to other websites within that. Link Tiger will go through your entire site and it will email you a report telling you all of the broken links within your site so you can go through and fix those. So that's going to be a big time saver. We tend to submit the site to pingomatic.com. There are lots of different services like this. No, it's just one that we happen to quite like. Submit your site, the RSS feed, and it will ping out to lots of the, the blog tracking sites and uh, all these the search engines for these. So that will just alert them that your site is being updated and they need to re go, go through a re-spider. At this point, I'll jump back into Google Analytics. And in Google Analytics, I'm now, because the site is launched, I will set up reports to go on a particular schedule to myself, uh, any other staff in the office that need to know, and to the client. You can tailor those reports. Whatever you can see on the Google Analytics page, you can essentially send a report out. So there could be one for marketing, one for finance, um, one for anyone that's involved in the search engine optimization, so they can just keep track of things. Set up on a weekly, monthly, or quarterly basis, and you'll be amazed how often you'll get a thank you email from your client who thinks that you've gone in proactively on that particular day and sent them an email with all their stats. So I definitely do that at this point. Um, with regards to ongoing tracking and monitoring of the site, uh, you want to know that the site's up. You don't want to get a phone call from the client saying the site's down and the answer from you is, oh, crikey, it's it. So, if you want to be alerted to that, one service that I really like is Pingdom.com. And you can set up for one particular site individually. You can set up a free account with Pingdom, or you can sign up, as many of us would, for the, for the more business level account. Uh, there's a fee for the year, but you can add lots of sites in, and you can send you text message alerts when the site's down and it's up. It'll also send you a report each month of the total number of outages and downtime. So that can be really useful when you're providing a report to a client and keep track of things. Now on more of a high level, business level, um, you may be offering support packages to your clients. Make sure that you're delivering on these, so at this point I refer back to the original proposal, whatever they've agreed to with regards to support and ongoing maintenance, and just know that you put that in place. So whatever there is with regards to backing up the site, maintenance, keeping on top of updates and this kind of thing, make sure you're, you're doing what you said you'd do. With regards to the domain name, we use a service called domain-safe.net where we've imported the CSV of all of the domains that we look after for our clients and it will now email us if there's any change with the WHOIS records, it will email us alerts if any site needs to, any, any domain needs to be renewed and this kind of thing. 
we have, through various experiences, we, we no longer trust 100% registration companies to do all this for you and not let sites disappear. Um, so it's a great idea to have this as a fail-safe. Don't just rely on a registration company for your domain management. Use something like this as an extra service. They've got a free service and a paid service. I think it's 15 pounds a year, so we're no longer going to track through your domains. At this point, you have to have decided what your billing process will be, your terms, conditions, and payment, and what you want to do either 14 days or 30 days before launch or on the launch day, whatever, however you want to do it, you want to make sure that you build the client. Um, it may sound obvious, but if you forget, and as I mentioned earlier, the client will tend to assume anything up until they've written that check is included in the original bill. So suddenly you end up with scope creep coming in, the project takes longer and longer and longer, they've had more people come in and see it and give their opinion, and you have to pander to all of their needs. So make sure you build, build the client on time and get that money in. You've done the work, you deserve it, so get that in as quickly as possible. And we've launched, so now we want to tell the world about it. We want to promote the site. We've already talked about how we're going to do that through the search engines. Um, so but at this point, we tend to do a social media announcement. Now, there are two sides of the promotion, I tend to think. There's promotion of, of us in this room, the work that we've done, and there's promotion of the actual website that you've launched yourself for your client. So, with regards to what we've done, we'll be putting links out to that site within the Juma community, on our Facebook fan page, on Twitter, and these kind of things. And what we find when we do that is immediately, a bunch of the people that are here at this conference today will go on the site and give you feedback. And it's always positive, and then often with a little constructive criticism. I found a bug here, you want to check that, you thought of doing this differently. And that can be really, really helpful, um, because you can make sure you get these things fixed as quickly as possible. You get a, a, a hundred or so uh, knowledgeable junior people looking at your site, who can get feedback on what works and what doesn't much quicker than if you wait for your client to have finally a, a thousand or ten thousand real world visitors on the site. They tend to not report things to you. So rely on the Juma community because we help each other when we see things that are wrong, uh, we'll let people know. Um, with regards to the actual client, make sure that they're promoting the site as well. I think it's really important to explain to people that you have to market the website. It's not a case of build it and they will come. So you want to get them doing these announcements as well. Perhaps you're managing the social media for your client, in which case you can put these, these announcements out <coughs> in, the, in that arena, but otherwise encourage them to do so. Um, something we're looking to get into more and more is uh, press releases. And press releases, again, both for the customer and for you. A press release about the new site, or the new brand launch, or whatever it might be, the new business, um, can be great, and it can set it apart from the rest of their competition. But also from your point of view. Um, you know, if you can find your, your own company, your own work being featured in some of the web development blogs, some of the magazines, these kind of things, that would be really great to boost your profile. And again, as I said, it means you've got technical people coming on site and giving you really useful, relevant feedback. Make sure if you're doing a press release about your work, you'll link to you or your portfolio directly with that case study in mind, um, but also to the site itself. Don't just promote the site if you're doing talk about yourself within, within the press release. Point to your own, to your own work. Um, there are a couple of paid ones that are useful, Business Wire or PR Newswire, uh, prxbuilder.com, um, and there are loads and loads of free ones, and uh, Mashable did a, a page with about 20 or so free PR uh, services online. Uh, it was an old one, I think it was 2007 or 2008, so there's about 150 comments in there with more up-to-date sources as well. Um, there's one called ecomwire.com um, with a double M in the middle, and that's for e-commerce related news. It's one of the most relevant free ones for technical um, sort of press releases. So if anything you're doing is got something to do with e-commerce, then that can be a great way to go. So at this point, we have made sure that the site is as fast as possible, is as secure as possible. We've got a strategy in place for keeping on top of updates. Um, we've got ready for launch, all of our ducks in a row, we have pressed the button and launched it, and now we've marketed it to the world. And hopefully, the traffic is coming in now, and, uh, and you're getting good feedback. Now, what I've raced through today, I know there's a lot to take in. Um, one of the things that I want to do is take our CSV file that we have, that we import into the little tracker at the start of any project. Um, it starts off in spreadsheet form. Uh, from any feedback that you guys want to give me today, I, I propose to improve on that, add in any tips, add in any any tips or best practice things that you want to add 
we put that in there and then release it back to the community. So you can either have it as a spreadsheet tick box or you can pull it straight into the Pilgrim Tracker if you're doing that. Um, it seems to me that there's a lot to go through, especially for someone that's new to Joomla. There's a lot of things you need to do if you want to launch your site properly. Um, and it may just be, well, that's a fact. You know, there's a lot you got to do. We're building websites. It's not, you know, just a couple of things that we need to get done here. Um, but any opportunity that we can have to automate or simplify the process is always welcome. Um, those people that are new to Joomla, they don't think they should have to go and figure all this stuff out for themselves as they go along. Um, so guiding them to the right places within the community websites um, and providing this kind of information, I hope it's going to be helpful to them. Um, that is the conclusion of my talk on best practice. Um, the reason that I didn't show lots and lots of code on the screen and all the different tick boxes and everything is because it, we would get bogged down in the, in the minutiae of that. But as I say, my plan is to release uh, speech notes uh, on this presentation and welcome any comments from me that you may have that I can include into that. So thank you very much for your time and uh, yeah, I'd welcome any feedback. Please, man. Brilliant. I've been working with Joomla for years, and, then, but, and there's two great things for me, which is I feel exhausted having to, having to listen to that. <laughs> that, that, was, that was Jack speaking slowly. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't exhausted with Jack, I was exhausted with, oh my god, look at all these things. Yes, I know we do them, but oh my god. And, and I just think whether you're new to Joomla or old to Joomla, you've given a fantastic um, presentation about best practice that we could all you know, really, really take on board. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, thank you. I, I, know it's, I know it's not complete and all-encompassing, but it's always evolving. And that's why we do what we do, I think. That's, that's why I do what I do, because it's always changing every day. There's new toys and new tools to play with. So, uh, yeah, always evolving. And so thanks for that. And I think what's, what's important is that when Jack started the whole talk talking about Pivotal Trap or any, pre any Agile project management tool, is that if you have that CSV and it's, and it's fluid and you're able to update it, as long as the methodology we're going to say, in other words, we're importing this list in, means we cannot miss anything out, it's all got to be done. But it doesn't <coughs> really matter how this changes, does it? No. no. We, just, we can just improve on it. It's just the methodology. Yeah. Hi. But as you can see when you look at the list, there's a lot of things you do every cycle over and over again. It's all repeating things and what we tend to do now is we have one last human site. Uh, get all the uh, side of things in there, like the GCN and so on. Yep. You know, do all that. Then maybe we can do a backup. Mm -hmm. And when you do so in eight sites, just use this configured site already, and that saves you so many of these points. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if, if that was picked up on the camera, the suggestion was taking Joomla, stripping out what you don't need, doing as many of these best practice items as you can, and then making and keep a backup of that. So that's what you work from from the start. Um, we've dabbled with that. Um, Did we and, start out doing that originally? Wasn't it? Yeah, we, we've used that in the past, um, and th that's great if you if you can keep on top of everything at the early stage before that and keep a backup. Um, the sites that we build. We're building so many of them and so quickly that we tend to just do this on a more manual basis and it can then evolve with each different site. Um, but absolutely, that, doing that is a great way to go if that works within your workflow. Yeah. I had actually considered doing something like that, but I find that when I'm, I have a site and it, it's probably, I built it with an older version of Joomla, Joomla's been updated, the extensions get updated. Uh, and I would prefer to just always, I know what extensions I need, I'm going to go and it forces me to check and see if there's newer versions of the extensions I'm installing uh, and I download them, put them in my folder and then I can install them. I, I think we also found a lot of the sites ended up being very much the same. But that, was, that was my memory of that process, that we, we, we were feeling increasingly less invested in each new project, weren't we? It's just flicking a switch. Yeah, with, with the way, with this approach, we find that we really get our teeth sunk into it and nothing's forgotten. And it's always fresh and you're doing it every time. But yeah, if, if the aim is purely is, is the time saving, yeah. so yeah. then we don't everything in Sure. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Yeah. That's just the mouse you're getting.
Yeah, and and that and it may well be that that becomes another item in our in our best practice in the future yeah. that we go back to doing it that way. Yeah. yeah, but good for you. It's diligent that you that you keep on top of that in that way, keep it always up to date and work from that. Definitely. Yeah. Any other questions or feedback? My contact details are up here. Um, this is me on Twitter, Jack Raymond. Any tips that you might have, do please just fire them through or, or catch me uh, today. I'm here today and, and half tomorrow as well. So any ideas are really welcome. Uh, this talk today stemmed from a little unconference session that we did last year at, at JMBO in 2010, um, when we had about eight of us in the room throwing some ideas in. And uh, as I moved more into a project management role rather than the actual technical development role, um, for me this becomes ever more important and, and more interesting. Um, so I hope you share some of that interest today. Thank you very much for your time. Sure,